Hello, Kate. It's good to see you again. So, tell me, how was your pregnancy up until now? How far are you pregnant? So, almost 29 weeks. Um, and everything's going well. So the doctor's happy, which means I'm happy. She's fit and healthy. So all going very, very well. Shame. Do you have a name already? We're, we're still debating names. We, mm -hmm. we haven't reached anything just yet. So we'll probably wait until she's born before announcing. Mm -hmm. But we're tossing up a couple of options at the moment. Yeah. So as hope is, as part of that name, there's something like hope in it. Because she must have given you hope. And I just think... Um, the first time, Kate, if we maybe go back, what's it, 2020, I saw you for the first time. Mm -hmm. I still remember clearly when you were sitting in that chair and Barry, Barry was sitting next to you, your husband. Um, and again, just my thoughts during that sort of interview or consultation was, yeah, I just think it was all overwhelming because you've yeah. been diagnosed with cancer recently and, mm -hmm. um, and again, you're still trying to get your head around that and the next thing to say, well, potentially this sort of treatment of cancer that's going to save your life is most likely going to take away one of the most precious things a female will have and that's mm -hmm. her fertility. So so that to have that sort of double sort of things to deal with, that must have also been so difficult. No, it's a bit surreal because I suppose at the time of a cancer diagnosis you're dealing with your own mortality. Um, and then to have raised the facts on new life, um, it's very polar opposites. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, overwhelming would be the right word because at this point, I mean, I didn't know much about the cancer world. So you get sort of thrown into it. Um, and there's just so many decisions, big life altering questions that you've got. Um, and so the fertility thing is, was almost a sideline. Um, because there's just too much to deal with. You can't take it all on at the same time. Mm. And how did you get to the point where the issue was raised? Was it by your oncologist or something that you and Barry did ask the oncologist? So it was through the oncologist and um, my surgeon. Um, so luckily I had a multidisciplinary team um, and we were quite fortunate in the fact that we had actually gone through and um, we're, we're going through the process of looking to fall pregnant when we discovered that I had breast cancer. Um, and that made fertility top of mind for all of the doctors and all of the medical professionals, mm -hmm. um, because it's definitely not something that we would have thought of by ourselves um, and possibly not something we would have researched either. Mm -hmm. Because I suppose, again, there's so many different things going on at that point in time. You, you just don't think about it. Um, yeah, and I think that's an important point, is just the awareness. Eh? The awareness mm -hmm. that needs to be created amongst patients, amongst the public, and amongst uh, oncologists and surgeons as well. And I must say that has been top of our agenda as well, to try and say, well, this is what we can do in fertility care as well, and just to tell our oncology partners as well that these services are available. and. And again, yeah, you said today and you're a product of that awareness. And I'm just so grateful that, that, that we did pick you up through the system. So taking me through your sort of chemotherapy, um, you were on these drugs. Your, your breast cancer was estrogen positive. Yes. So I was diagnosed with two different types of breast cancer. Um, so luminal B, which was estrogen positive, and then HER2 positive breast cancer as well. Mm. And as part of the discussion with your oncologist, they did discuss that they are going to give you the chemotherapy that is more uh, fertility preserving. Yes. Um, and just looking at the combination you had, I think it was your taxols, your anthracyclines, and your cyclophosphamide. Mm -hmm. um, so in that combination, and fortunately in medicine, there's been multiple publications these days that to know exactly what effect it will have on your fertility. And we know it's going to have about a 20 to 80 percent chance, which we will call an intermediate risk of getting you into a sort of a premature menopause. So we would still classify it as intermediate. Um, but on a day when we discussed this, obviously I had to see what, what is your current fertility status. Yeah. You were 35 years of age, I think then. That's correct. And um, so the two tests that we would usually do to test the female's fertility is usually by starting to say, well, what is your egg reserve? And so we did your anti-malarian hormone, um, which came back as 0.8. 
And again, if you compare that to um, your age group, um, we would have expected at least about 1.8 to mm -hmm. 2. So, so we already know that your uh, anti-millennial hormone was significantly lower. And again, to look at that component and as well as the intermediate risk chemotherapy you're going to use, that most likely will render you after the chemotherapy as having a very low egg reserve or almost depleted your, your egg pool. And I think that when we do risk stratification, that would have put you in a high risk of losing your fertility. Yeah. And so, Kate, yeah, just seeing you, and sometimes sometimes we have patients the way we do risk stratification, where we say, well, you've got a very high reserve, and most likely the chemotherapy you're going to be on will unlikely, well, will affect your fertility, but not mm. as much, and there will still be a very good chance of you conceiving naturally one day. But in your case, it was quite evident that we need to offer you fertility preservation um, to try and save some of your fertility, to make sure that you and Barry have a family, have mm. biological children, and and also just reach for that dream. Um, just tell me about the process as well. So then we, we set this, and I know, I still remember like yesterday that, um, you weren't sort of, you obviously you were overwhelmed, first of all, both of you, and um, I think there was, I won't say from Barry, but it was a bit of, not anger, but you know, you just see uh, contented and what are we talking about, but but to almost have that sort of double news that, yes, I've got a lower fertility, so now that again, now this as well. Um, and I still remember you walking out here, and, and usually what we would do is to give you a day or two to decide on this treatment, because there's financial costs as well. Um, I don't know if your fertility was covered in part by your medical aid, but to have that sort of extra burden of, of financial expenses as well. Um, but yeah, and then I think two days later, you let one of our sisters know that you are you are going to go ahead. And uh, so on the sort of the fertility path, when we said, well, okay. And one thing you know about fertility, preservation is we it's time sensitive so we need to sort of start immediately as soon as you give us the go ahead to say well we're not going to wait for your cycle we do random stimulation so where we would just start to stimulate you uh, without you waiting for your period and and then usually on average to stimulate you about for eight to ten days and then go and harvest harvest the eggs um, can you maybe just give me some sort of your views on that that sort of pathway of fertility preservations on that sort of small journey you had here with us as well. How was the injections and uh, the process? We took it all one step at a time, I think. Um, in the beginning, it was a little overwhelming with injections. And I mean, at that point, I was completely freaked out about injections. So um, over the medical journey that I went through, I've now come, become completely desensitized to them. Um, but it was a set standard process. Um, it was all structured um, very well. Um, and you guys let us know what we needed to do when we needed to do it. Um, and so it literally was just following the process. Um, and at that point, I think everything was an autopilot. So mm. following the process was good. Um, it just meant that we kept on day to day to day um, and continued. Um, mm. Uh, along the journey mm. so definitely became more real when we came out the other side um, and we'd done the preservation I mean the preservation I think at that point was all just a bit of a whirlwind and a blur for us mm. yeah, and the whole process just going through all of this like you say all this new technology the, the different medical sort of experiences and and all of this and like you say most likely it was just a big blur to you I just think from a reproductive point of view, someone with an aim age of 0.8, we did give you high doses of injections just to stimulate your own say, well, just give us what you've got. So we got 15 eggs, which I think was excellent. Um, but then we did um, what we would call IVF with the sperm, very good sperm. And then only five of those eggs fertilize. Again, when there's suddenly such a big drop off, obviously we, we get concerned, but then again, this is natural selection. This mm. is the five eggs we are focused on. And I think on day five, we had two blastocysts, beautiful looking blastocysts. 
And I did decide to biopsy them because one of the concerns was, are you maybe a carrier of the BRCA gene? So we were able to test these embryos for BRCA gene mutations, should you have tested positive. But we did do genetic testing on them and fortunately both of them came back genetically normal. And the day I think I remember when I phoned you to say, Kate, I don't know how you're doing, but got some excellent news. Both of these beautiful looking embryos are genetically normal. Can you maybe remember that maybe boosted you a bit or your your spirits or so it 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 definitely I suppose helped because um, having a look at the journey um, at that point getting thrown into everything um, there's so many additional questions that you have you're not quite sure suddenly we know we wanted children but should we be having children um, mm. will I be around to have kids. Um, and so all of those types of thoughts are going through your mind. Um, and what was so empowering about coming out, out of the journey um, and knowing that we had two embryos is that it empowered us to be able to make the decisions when we could, um, when we had capacity to, mm. when we had then, you know, clear minds. It, it was great not having to deal with everything all at once because mm. you're dealing with so much and to just have answers for everything is impossible. Mm. Um, and I think that was really great for us is that it allowed us to keep these options open um, so that we can revisit it when the time's right um, and cancer's not going to close all of the doors for us. Mm. We can still make the decisions um, and move forward um, when and if we're able to. Yeah, so. yeah. You make an important, important point, and I think this is just to take it step by step. I also think it's very important that when you are faced with a patient going through all the challenges that you had as well, to try and get them a treatment plan and to say, mm. we're going to follow this pathway. Um, there is evidence that, published evidence to show us that as well, that if you do give these patients a clear pathway, that your compliance to their medication is much better so that they won't stop their medication to say, well, leave this alone. I want to go and try and conceive. And mm -hmm. I think the fortunate part about you is that you were known, we've already got our embryos here. So we will let our oncologist guide us to say, well, we are safe now. We can take our fertility break mm -hmm. and, um, and, and just follow those clear guidelines. And, so evidence has shown that if you do give these guidelines that your compliance to treatment are much better. And, and I, point, I think you just, just pointed it out as well. So then there was the, the chemo and that must have been a difficult time. Definitely not fun. No. <laughs> Would not recommend it um, unless you have to do it. Um, so yeah, no, those were, it was a, a rough six months and then continued cancer treatment after that. Mm. Um, because you went on a hormonal treatment, mm. it, so. so I went on a hormonal treatment um, for the one cancer, and then I was on additional um, cancer blockers, which was drip treatment mm. for a year post chemo as well. Okay. Um, so, and that was the tramazepam. Yeah, okay. And, and then you did then at some stage you went to your oncologist to say and was it something that he raised that you wanted to take a fertility break or do you want to start looking at your family uh, building a family or was it something that you were sort of you and Barry now feeling a bit most likely a bit more reassured now, that mm. you the cancer the memory starts to fade away a bit and that you now start looking in in, in building that family you wanted that you very originally um, planned. Um, so it was just a joint discussion coming from, from you and Barry and then asking the oncologist. Just. Most definitely. I mean, I think the oncologist knew from the outset that we possibly wanted to explore um, taking a, a break um, to look at fertility, mm -hmm. um, a pregnancy break in our treatment. Um, and he was sort of supportive and he guided us through the process um, and even now um, he's looking after me. I mean, there's a full team of medical mm. experts um, and everyone's watching and making sure that the risk is as low as possible. Um, mm. And I mean, I'm just so grateful to have such a multidisciplinary team mm. um, where all aspects are considered 
um, and we're trying to ensure that the risk is as low as possible. Sure. So I'm very blessed. So it was two years and then you gave, you decided, okay, it's, it's time to start transferring mm. the embryos. So yeah, Kate, on the day of the transfer, I don't know if you do still have some memories of that day, because I always believe as, as when we do in vitro fertilization, that is the, the highest point and the apex of our treatment as well. And we, we always feel the emotions when you do the, the transfers. I don't know if there was any thoughts going through your mind as well on that day. And can you still remember some of it when you transferred to Ingram? No, definitely. Um, I suppose it's, it's a big day. I mean, and as you've mentioned, it's not exactly as if we have got many tries. So mm. definitely a bit nervous and, and trying to relax and, and say if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. Um, you know, our aim is to give it the best possible chance um, and give ourselves the best possible of chance, um, do what we can, um, and then leave it up to fate and, and see whether it's, it's meant to be. So mm -hmm. it's definitely a process of trying to let go um, mm -hmm. and just sort of embrace it because you mm -hmm. don't know if you're going to be successful, if you're not going to be successful. Um, to accept it that you're not in control. This is yeah. out of our hands. And once we, we, we put the embryo in a good spot, to stand back and say, yeah, let, let's, um, we, we can't do much more than this. Mm. Um, and then that's the 12 days of waiting. And that feels like a That is eternity. a lifetime. <laughs> exactly. mm. So that is definitely um, almost willing yourself not to think about it for 12 days. Mm. Um, and all you want to do is go through and get the blood test. And But again, you just got to wait it up. And, again to try and take a very philosophical view um, or at least that's what I try to mm -hmm. do um, where it's one step at a time and if it's going to work it's going to work and we've I suppose it's it builds confidence knowing that you've done everything that you can mm -hmm. um, and and that does give you some hope because I know that you know we've put everything in we've done what we can to make mm -hmm. it a possibility for us um, and so, you know, there's no stone unturned. Um, and, and that was a, a good feeling as well. Yeah, and I think you raised an important point because we do know that if you defer fertility preservation, then some of those patients will have regret. And I think that's so unfortunate that sometimes finances need to play a part of that mm. because we do know that at least 40% of our patients that want to do fertility preservation do not have the financial means to do that. It's just additional financial strain on them. So, and again, we do know some of them will have some form of regret to say, sure, we would have done it and, and not. And like you said, you've done everything you can to save it and it's not in our hands. It will be what will be, will mm. be. So, um, but yeah, trust me, the day when you did your pregnancy test, it was positive. The whole clinic was in elation and yeah. Obviously, it uplifted you, but it lifted all the spirits of, of, of the clinic staff as well. So, again, it's um, so yeah, we were very fortunate that, that it, it played out well. And now you're 29 weeks, eh? and oh. uh, amazing, amazing story. So, Kate, and just after the pregnancy, that you obviously you're going to go back on the hormonal treatment. Yeah. So that will, I think, we'll wait about um, sort of six weeks um, after giving birth. Then we'll go back on hormonal treatment um, and we'll also then do PET and CT scans just to make sure that everything's clear as well. Okay. So back into the thick of things. Yeah. And just as a last point I would like to make um, is that the pathway we have followed with you, and again this is now supported by evidence to show you us that whatever treatment we are doing, the hormonal stimulation, Two, week, two weeks of waiting, the fertility break you just took now as well, seems to be that the literature are supporting us to say that it does not increase your risk of a relapse. So just to have that reassurance mm -hmm. as well that you have, and like you said it as well, all this testing, um, all the, the medical advances that we've seen as well, that now shows us that you will be okay. So whatever route we decide to stay on, on the safe side and to follow evidence-based medicine. Um, so yeah, we're looking forward to on the day when 
your baby, it's baby girl, yes. it's going to be delivered, you're still looking for a name. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll see, <laughs> so, but we're on the countdown, we can't wait to meet okay. her, so very, very excited. May it, may it be a very blessed day for you and Barry, and I would like just to thank you um, for sharing your story, because I know there is many women out there, and there will be in future, because cancer is, is part of our life. And I do think the way that it's not about the tragedy of the cancer. I think during that period is when you just see all these other positives. And like you pointed it out as well, a, a good multidisciplinary team looking mm -hmm. after you, people looking after you, the support you've been given by your family. Just to look at all these positive points and, and the fertility preservation. It's just how this, in times, dark times like this, how it sort of lights up your your life then to say, let's rather look and focus on these other parts as well. So, because there's people that care and there's a life to live. So, so yeah, That's, thank you, Kate. It's great and it, it's great coming out the other side and knowing that cancer hasn't defined me um, and hasn't defined the life that I'm going to be leading. Um, obviously, I suppose to an extent it, it always will, um, but it hasn't taken away um, the possibility of a family, which for us is just so important. Excellent. Thank you, Grace. Thank you.